What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. Welcome back to the channel. This is BDGE. Big dogs gotta eat fantasy football. I'm Nicholas. Hope y'all are doing mwah, fantastic today. Hope you had a fantastic weekend. This is another uh, nah son episode, if you want to put it at that. These are these are players to avoid. These are wide receivers in 2019 fantasy football that you should not draft. The do not draft wide receivers of 2019 fantasy football. We went over the running backs that I'm avoiding anywhere near their ADPs on last Tuesday's video. And you're watching this on Monday, which means it's June and we're doing five videos a week. Every single day, you're going to see my face page. As well as on Sundays, we're going to start uploading individual player outlooks on Sundays. So we have a lot of stuff in the works, but today we're going to focus on wide receivers. On Wednesday, we're going to get into quarterbacks and tight ends. This is just the Nasun week. All right. So before we start the video, drop a couple of the wide receivers that you are by no means touching anywhere near their ADP. As always, we go by the ADPs on draft.com. Draft.com is a best ball site, but you do have to pay in order to draft. The ADPs are good. The rankings are real because people are paying money. So you're getting a realistic view of where players are actually getting picked. Wide receivers, do not draft list. Comment down below who you are staying away from. I want to know ASAP prior to the video starting. So maybe we got the same guys. If you enjoyed the video, make sure you hit that thumbs up button. If you are new to the channel, make sure you subscribe because again, five videos a week, all off season, all the way through K off all the way through the season and then into the offseason next year talking dynasty fantasy football all right let's get it all right so before we jump into this first wide receiver couple things i'm sure we have a lot of overlapping audiences myself and the fantasy footballers if any of you guys are going to their live shows they have one in new york gramercy theater gramercy in manhattan and i was talking with andy last night and he's gonna give me two tickets to that show so i will be at the one i believe it's on june uh, june 29th so it's in like four saturdays from now if any of y'all are going to the show <clears throat> at Gramercy Theater for the fantasy footballers, let me know. Drop a comment or email me or whatever, because I would love to do like an in-person meetup with some of the people that are going to be, you know, going to that show as well. I think tickets are like 29 bucks, but he's going to leave me too. So I'm going to go. I will meet up with anyone that wants to grab drinks beforehand. We can get a little hammered and then heckle the shit out of them. So make sure you let me know. Let's get into it. The first wide receiver I'm absolutely avoiding, and this should kind of be common sense, I feel like, is Corey Davis of the Tennessee Titans. Currently, the wide receiver 32 being picked 84th overall. Davis went into last year with a lot of hype, and you know it, it's well warranted given the draft capital as a top 10 pick that he was for the Titans a couple of years back. Big breakout candidate, absolutely disappointed, right? If you had told me going into the year that Davis was going to see 27% of his team's targets, I would have been all in. Thankfully, no one in my audience is a snitch. None of y'all told me that shit. I think it was like 26.4% of his team's targets, man. Those are like elite wide receiver one type target shares. That was the eighth most targets or the highest percentage of targets on their own team of any wide receiver in the NFL. So eighth highest target rate share. Those are up there with like the OBJs, the Julios, DeAndre Hopkins, Amate Adams. They're a little bit higher, maybe like 29%-ish, but... 26.4% is a, is a massive number. Problem is he finished as the wide receiver 33 overall. He turned 112 targets into 65 receptions, 895 yards, and four touchdowns, and 10 dropped passes. So not only was he not efficient, not only did he not compile stats with the volume, but he was actually very inefficient in a sense. So Davis was just pretty bad last year overall. You can't entirely blame Corey Davis for the lack of success that he had last year. You know, after being the fifth overall pick in the draft, he's got a lot of hype, but like there's not a lot to back him up when it comes to the offense overall. You look at the situation he's in, the quarterback he's catching passes from, just the offense overall is one of the worst conditions that you could have for a fantasy wide receiver, right? These are the Tennessee Titans offensive ranks um, among the other NFL teams since Ma uh, Marcus Mariota has taken over as the starting quarterback in 2015. Their pass attempt volume, 21st, 28th, 28th, 31st. This is starting in 2015, going up to 2018. Passing yardage, 26th, 25th, 23rd, 29th. Passing touchdowns, 18th, 8th, 30th, 29th. So outside of like one year where they finished 8th in passing touchdowns, they have been one of the worst, least efficient passing offenses in the entire NFL. So we're talking about a really low pass volume offense that brought in two more additional pass catchers, Adam Humphreys and second round pick AJ Brown. With Humphreys signing a 40 year, $36 million deal, he is without a doubt going to be inserted into the slot there. I don't know what the fuck they were thinking, putting 
36 million dollars into adam humphrey's bank account but nfl teams never cease to amaze aj brown is one of the in my opinion one of my favorite wide receiver prospects that's come out in the last four or five years for real he is really 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 good they use second round draft capital on him he's probably going to start outside opposite of Corey davis just another mouth to feed there uh and the problem is too with with adam humphreys taking over the slot role it's like if there was a spot where Corey davis was going to succeed and develop it would have been playing in the slot more right we're seeing a lot of these bigger wide receivers like the jujus michael thomas's adam thielen's tyler boyd's like those guys right the six foot plus and 200 pound ish guys transition to the slot where they have easier matchups and they're and they're being super hyper efficient from inside the slot and that's where Corey davis probably would have been able to put up at least decent numbers this year had he stayed there, not going to happen this year. It, it actually happened last year. I wanted to see because we heard a lot of a, a hype around Matt LaFleur going over to Green Bay and we're hearing, you know, Devonta Adams is going to play in the slot more. And now reports kind of just surfaced a couple days ago that Toronto Allison is going to play in the slot more. I wanted to, you know, really dive into the numbers and, and seeing if this is just coach speak or if this is a real thing. Matt LaFleur was the offensive coordinator for the Tennessee Titans last year, right? And you look at Corey Davis's snaps in 2017, prior to LaFleur coming over, he was out wide on 91.5% of his routes in the slot for 8.5% of his routes. Matt LaFleur comes over and he wants to use those big wide receivers in the slot last year. And you see the percentage change, right? He went from 91.5% of his routes being run on the outside to 70.3. So now he was a 30% slot receiver. He was running 30% of his routes in the slot in 2018 with Matt LaFleur there. Matt LaFleur is now gone. So I'm assuming with their tight ends coach taking over as the offensive coordinator there, I would assume they're just going to shove Davis back outside with Adam Humphreys taking over the slot. He's going to be competing for outside targets with a quarterback who's not necessarily too accurate on the outside and just not a high passing volume. They're going to have Derrick Henry running the ball a lot. So I would absolutely not expect a breakout coming in 2019. They need to find their identity, man. Mariota either stays healthy or they get a new quarterback. And I think Davis is going to continue to disappoint for fantasy football in 2019. So I'm staying away from him anywhere near, you know, those top 85 picks. If you enjoyed that breakdown, by the way, make sure you hit that thumbs up button. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you're new. Because we're breaking down everything like this. Oh, and the other thing I wanted to say too, I'm going to bring the camera around here. Something I'm actually working on, you know, the draft guide goes up on July 1st. So I'm starting to work very, very, very hard on the stuff that I'm putting into the Big Dogs Draft Guide this summer. One of the cool things that I will be working on is I'm putting together this giant market share sheet because one of the coolest stats I think you could find when it comes to fantasy football is the market share to your specific team, right? And I wanted to look at Tennessee's, and this is obviously just a very raw file. I'm going to make it nice and spicy and throw it into the draft guide for you guys. So like looking at all the players and not just like target market share, right? We're talking about reception market share, 40 plus yard reception market share, receiving yards market share, 100 plus yard receiving games, touchdowns, carries, drops, fumbles, you know, literally everything is included in this fantasy points market share. So this is another little treat that I will have in the draft guide. And the draft guide, again, goes live July 20th. But you can cop it now for a 20% discount on the pre-order price. That's on bigdogsdraftguide.com. It'll have that. It'll have my top 250 big board rankings, positional rankings by tiers, busts, sleepers, must draft players, and then a bunch of other cool exclusive stuff just like that uh, market share worksheet. So working very hard on it and it will absolutely not disappoint. It will be literally your one-stop shop for everything you need for your 2019 fantasy football season. The second wide receiver I am avoiding is James Washington of the Pittsburgh Steelers. Now, James Washington got a lot of love as soon as Antonio Brown was traded, right? And James Washington started, I, I put a tweet out, I remember, as soon as the trade happened, and I'm going to have to go back and find the tweet, but I put a poll out asking when you guys on Twitter, like my followers, would start drafting James Washington. And I'm pretty sure the final poll came back as like a sixth, seventh round pick. Now, his ADP has absolutely shot up. He's like a, a tenth or, or later round pick now. So the value is a little bit better and it's not as risky, of course. But it, it, this, I guess, is just more so for those people that think that want to get cute, right? And start looking at him in the seventh, eighth, ninth round. I'm telling you to stay away from him. Antonio Brown is gone. That Sure. But I, I think the signing of Dante Moncrief on the outside, the draft capital of Deontay Johnson, the rookie that they just took, speaks a little bit louder, right? And I dove really deep into the Pittsburgh situation in a video that I will link down below or, you know, up here or whatever about the Antonio Brown trade and what I saw as the effects of it, right? What Antonio Brown would do in Oakland and what it meant for the rest of the pass catchers in Pittsburgh. And I didn't like James Washington then. 
and I still don't like him now. They add a couple more outside receivers after the fact. There's really nothing enticing to me about Washington. So this is a thread I tweeted out pretty much. I was using some of the Rotoviz apps to filter out players and things like that. So the problem with the James Washington breakout in 2019 is that he did almost nothing in 2018. 16 catches, 217 yards, and one touchdown. I exported a file of all of the wide receivers since the year 2000 that have had 220 receiving yards or fewer in their rookie years. That is a list of 465 different wide receivers. At the time, you know, people were talking about a James Washington breakout. So I wanted to say, what's a realistic breakout number? I didn't want to be like 1,200 yards because obviously that's, you know, only a handful of players even hit that number on a, on a regular year. I would put a breakout season at about 800 receiving yards, right? So I wanted to see of those 465 wide receivers that had 220 or fewer receiving yards in their rookie year, how many of them broke out? How many of them had 800 receiving yards or more that next year? Of those 465, eight of them went for 800 receiving yards in their second season. That is 1.7% of the players that broke out in the next season, guys. So if you really think James Washington is going to be that guy, go for it. I said 220 receiving yards or less. He only played in 12 games. Sure. So so he could have more if you look at an overall volume. So I broke it down by yards per game instead of just overall yards, right? He averaged 18.1 yards per game. So I looked at receivers that had 18.1 yards per game or fewer in the rookie seasons of the 465 receivers. And that number goes down even further. Now we don't have eight of 465 receivers breaking out. We have just three, which is 0.8%. When I look at James Washington, there is not a lot of good that came out of his rookie year. There were 104 wide receivers that saw at least 35 targets last year. 104 NFL wide receivers that saw 35 targets or more James Washington ranked 104th in yards per route run. Like, I really don't feel like anything else needs to really be said. When you hear someone backing up James Washington, the funny part is this. Like, everyone's like, oh, of course he's behind Antonio Brown. He's behind Juju Smith-Schuster. How is he going to do anything? James Washington was on the pl- on the field plenty last year. He played on 525 snaps last year. 100 fewer than Calvin Ridley. It was more than Dante Pettis. It was more than Christian Kirk. They produced fine. James Washington did not. I understand that the talent was ahead of him, but if you're on the field for over 500 snaps and you can't command any targets, I think that also speaks something about you. And anytime I hear people talking about James Washington and how you know they're excited about him or they're trying to back up the argument, they don't actually have any argument for James Washington. The only argument they have is defending all the bad stuff that happened to him last year. Oh, well, he was in behind Antonio Brown. He was behind Juju Smith-Schuster. It's like they don't actually have anything positive to say. And I think that's when you need to step back and be like, okay, let me actually be objective about this. He didn't do anything good. He just has excuses for why he was bad. He's like the Daniel Jones of wide receivers pretty much at this point. Because you look at like when Daniel Jones was drafted, they didn't show like his statistics. They didn't show his highlights from him playing in college. They were like, he's got athletic siblings in the family and shit like that. It's like, oh my God, that's when you know Daniel Jones is not good because they have nothing good to say about him. They just are, they're just reaching for things to say about him because they can't back it up with any stats and information and big facts. So the way I look at James Washington is like, if he's going to break out, I'm not saying he can't break out, but it is so much more likely that it's going to happen in 2020 than it is in 2019. I think this offense overall is going to go with a little bit more of a run heavy approach as well. They still do have a good offensive line and for as much hate as Big Ben is going to get, and I'll talk about him in Wednesday's video, I think he might drop to the point where like he might become a value. The argument for James Washington is just that he was behind those two, but he played 525 snaps. Like I said, I want to see production on the NFL field before I just mark a guy as a breakout candidate. Let's move on to a couple other homies and home mets. I like Chris Godwin. I actually love Chris Godwin as a player, and he was in my draft guide last year as a sleeper, as a breakout candidate. I think it might be getting to the point where he's getting drafted a little bit too high. He's within the top 20 wide receivers being drafted, fantasy wide receivers being drafted on draft.com right now. I believe he started the summer as like maybe wide receiver 28, 29. Fantastic value. He was going in like the seventh, eighth round. I tried to scoop him anywhere I could. Now he's getting to the point where he's within the top 50 picks. Like you're having to use, if you're a late fourth round pick, if you're like the 412, you have to grab Godwin there or you're not getting him. It's right behind guys like Kenny Galladay, right around Robert Woods, Sammy Watkins. And I'm like, you know, he's in front of Cooper Cup. He does deserve to be around those names, but like Kenny Galladay, like no way. I think it's getting to the point where the hype is getting just too high. Because you have Galladay and Watkins and their ceiling is is ridiculous, right? There's Godwin does not have the ceiling of Galladay or Watkins if everything breaks right for them. And then you look at the other guys like Robert Woods, who they might actually have around the same floor, right? Admittedly, they might have the same floor, 
But we've already seen Robert Woods do that, you know, multiple years where we have and we actually haven't seen Chris Godwin hit that floor where we kind of know already what Robert Woods is getting. I do like what I'm hearing from Bruce Arians and just like that Tampa Bay camp overall. But there's still a lot of mouths to feed there. And I'm not necessarily set on the fact that this offense is going to be prolific. Put out a stat yesterday. I don't remember if it was on Twitter or Instagram. Make sure you're following me on both of those. Tampa Bay has not been a top 10 scoring offense since the year 2000. 18 years without being a top 10 scoring offense. People think they're prolific because they put up a lot of garbage time numbers. But they were not top 10 last year. And that was with a historically bad defense and with Ryan Fitzpatrick throwing up like 400 yard games left and right. Still not a top 10 defense, uh, top 10 scoring offense. They lose to Sean Jackson. They lose Adam Humphreys. As much as everyone loves Bruce Arians, and I do, I think he's a great offensive coach. Like Dirk Cutter is one of the most pass heavy coaches in the NFL, right? And they had Todd Monk in there too, an OC who was a fantastic offensive mind. So as much as you want to hype up Bruce Arians like the delta between Bruce Arians and Dirk Cutter and Todd Munkin statistically speaking from a passing standpoint I don't think is going to be that big of an upgrade if it was going from like fucking Mike McCoy to Bruce Arians yeah there would be something to get really excited about here but it gets me a little nervous when we're seeing just how high Chris Godwin is going so Chris Godwin's not a guy I'm avoiding but at his current ADP it's very hard to buy into it Emmanuel Sanders Want nothing to do with him. 31, coming off a torn Achilles. Case Keenum was their quarterback last year. No one targets the slot more than Case Keenum does as a quarterback. We saw it with Adam Thielen. We saw it with Emmanuel Sanders when he came over. And then as soon as Emmanuel Sanders went down, we saw it with Deshaun Hamilton. Rinse, repeat. He only targets that part of the field. That's what Case Keenum does. Now they have Joe Flacco. Not going to be the same. Not going to be the same chemistry. They have Cortland Sutton. They have Deshaun Hamilton, who they're going to want to get involved very heavily. They have Tim Patrick, who looked really good. They brought in Noah Fant, their first round pick at tight end, who's a ridiculously athletic rookie tight end. So they have a lot of mouths to feed. I honestly wouldn't be surprised. They're not going to cut Emmanuel Sanders because he's got a lot of dead cap to him. I think it's like nine or $10 million. But one, he's coming back again from his torn Achilles, which is one of the most serious injuries you could have. When you're that old, it's harder to recover. I wouldn't be surprised if he ended up on the pup list. I uh, wouldn't be surprised if he was just really not utilized at all this year. And he was more of like a locker room presence and someone who can teach these young wide receivers how to develop and become real NFL wide receivers because they were all rookies last year, right? Hamilton, Cortland Sutton, like their backfield, Roy Freeman, Philip Lindsay, all rookies last year. Another stat I tweeted out that 61% of all offensive touches for the Broncos last year were accounted for by their rookie class. Tim Patrick is actually a second year player last year, undrafted free agent, didn't play at all in 2017. So he was kind of like a redshirt rookie uh, to a point. But Emmanuel Sanders, I am not in on whatsoever. I won't be personally drafting AJ Green. AJ Green seems to be pretty much like the Devonta Freeman of the wide receiver position this year because everyone is so bought into him being such a great value pick around, you know, in the third round. If he stays healthy, then the upside is there. When I look at AJ Green, I don't think he's passed 1,300 receiving yards since 2013. Like, you can make this excuse and that excuse and the other excuse, but like, get it done or you're not really that elite of a fantasy wide receiver. He was on pace to be a very good wide receiver last year, but he dealt with foot injury, the toe the toe injury that cost him a lot of games. And he's had injuries to his lower extremities that have cost him a lot of time over the last you know five or so years. And that's a concern for me because again, he's going to be 31 soon, coming off this serious injury. And this was someone that we talked about in my video with Dr. Jesse Morse, you know, target or avoid wide receivers based on injuries last year. I will link that down below. He said that AJ Green was a very big concern for him. And he's going to need to see him throughout preseason to, to, to know that he can actually plant on that toe and that foot and really explode like he used to. It's like if you need to use one of your first three picks on a guy who you need to say if he stays healthy, like that's, I, I really think that's a problem. The more early the picks are for you in season long drafts, the more risk averse I think you should be when it comes to guys with injuries, the guys that are older. And you just look at this offense overall, they have a new offensive coordinator, new head coach, which could mean good things, but it also doesn't have to mean good things. Neither of them have any coordinator or head coach experience before. It could go downhill very quickly. We have Andy Dalton. Hasn't been horrible, but he has been nothing extraordinary. Nothing, nothing that really adds a positive to AJ Green's fantasy outlook. He's ranked 18th and 34th in terms of deep ball accuracy per PFF over the last two seasons. He's one of the worst quarterbacks when under pressure, uh, ranking 31st, 17th, and 28th over the last three years in terms of accuracy when under pressure. And yeah, their line did improve, right? They used their first round pick on the left tackle out of Alabama, but he's still going to be under pressure plenty. That's not uh, an elite 
offensive line by any means. So that does not add up to, you know, the mathematics there are, are just not good. He's been serviceable, but I would rather draft a fantasy wide receiver at the end of the third round that's tethered to a quarterback or offense that I know is going to put up plenty of uh, plenty of numbers. So I also put this question on Twitter. You know, I was asking, because when I, when I do these videos, I like to hear your guys' feedback. Who are you guys avoiding at wide receiver this year in fantasy? And for the most part, it was almost just like you guys said a lot of teams entirely that you're avoiding. There was a lot of Buffalo, avoiding all of Buffalo's wide receivers, all of Miami's wide receivers, all of Washington's wide receivers, Baltimore's wide receivers. You could almost throw the Jets in there outside of Robbie Anderson. We're coming to a point where there are teams just like those guys that we named that you could almost avoid almost every wide receiver on all four of those teams. I saw a lot of Allen Robinson on that list as well. I made this video a few months ago talking about players overall just not to draft and Allen Robinson was on that list but at the time he was the 22nd wide receiver off the board pick 50 he's dropped significantly right he's now the 27th wide receiver off the board at pick 65 so he went down a full round and a half I get the situation right Mitch Trubisky is not an accurate outside thrower I do think he's going to see a bit of a bit of regression in the passing game I think they're going to run more a lot of mouse to there I think Anthony Miller is poised to break out this year David Montgomery the rookie running back is going to get a lot more targets than Jordan Howard got last year Robinson isn't someone I'm targeting for sure. But if he keeps moving down, right, if he's like sixth, seventh, eighth round pick, I will take some shares of Allen Robinson. If he's anywhere near back up that 50 spot, no, I won't be drafting him anywhere near that. Allen Robinson was a popular pick on there. Lots of Antonio Brown in the comments too. He's another guy who's, whose stock has dropped pretty far since the trade to Oakland. He was a mid second round pick. And now I think he's going like early third round, mid third round. I definitely wouldn't use one of my first two picks on him. I think I will probably get a share or two of him uh, if he is a third round pick. I think the volume will be there. This will be a high volume passing offense with Gruden, right? They're always like top 12 in, in passing attempts and he's going to be funnel targets one way or another. Not someone I'm necessarily excited about. I think he might disappoint just from like a touchdown and volume standpoint for like yardage and stuff. I don't think he's a necessarily a terrible third round pick. I saw a ton of T.Y. Hilton hate in, that, in those comments as well. I don't understand why he's someone that guys are avoiding. Him and Luck have four years going on, four years of fantastic chemistry. Funches is a complimentary red zone piece. He's not getting more than 70 targets this year. Hilton is not a red zone threat anyways. So Funches can take those red zone threats and it won't have any impact on Hilton. Hilton is not a guy that you're targeting within the 10 yard line anyways, right? So you're not banking on those fantasy points. Paris Campbell, sure, but he's a rookie. He's not going to get more than, you know, 50 to 55 targets for 2019. It's going to be a much better real life piece for them than an actual fantasy piece and someone that takes away from T.Y. Hilton's offense. T.Y. Hilton is the wide receiver one in a prolific offense, uh, an offense that scored the fifth most points overall in the entire league last year, an elite offensive line, give Andrew Luck time to drop back. His, his shoulders finally, you know, completely healed where it wasn't in the beginning of last year. He, Hilton will be healthy finally, even though he went off when he wasn't healthy last year. So he'll have plenty of time to get open with a great offensive line with Andrew Luck not afraid to throw it down the field. And this offense might be the number one scoring offense in the entire NFL next year. Do not be surprised if that happens. I don't understand how Hilton is a guy you could be possibly avoiding at the end of uh, at the end of round three. I love Hilton. Stop avoiding him. Please, please don't waste a draft pick on Josh Gordon. I can't believe I even have to say this, but there, I see people taking Josh Gordon in best ball leagues. Please don't waste a draft pick on Josh Gordon. Please, 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 please do yourself a favor. That's all I got for today, guys. That's all I got. Again, if you want more big facts, July 1st, they will be hitting stores. BigDogsDraftGuide.com. Pre-order it now. 20% off pre-order price all of June. Dropping July 1st. It's got everything in there. Make sure you hit that thumbs up button if you enjoyed the video. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you are new. We're dropping shit like this all week, every week, basically for the rest of my life. Same. See y'all tomorrow. Peace.